Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, we're going to bridge the generation gap. I have Jason Bade, or J. Bay, as his younger crowd know him, is uh, Chief Prospecting Officer at Blissful Prospecting. What do they do? They help people land large deals and help them stop getting the crappy responses from their cold emails and from their calls so that they stop wasting and creating dead time for themselves. We're going to be talking about things like burnout, the more, more, more mentality, more technology, more metrics, more complexity, more layers. And we're also going to explore um, what we think about the, uh, the future of sales. Particular f- uh, favorite topic is why pros- people make prospecting so difficult for themselves. So that's kind of what we're going to cover today. JB, welcome. I'm excited for this, man. I'm used to either interviewing you, which I've done on my podcast, or hearing you interviewed, and you're just like, woo, bringing the heat. So I'm curious okay. what it's going to okay. be like being on the other end of the... <laughs> oh, it's very gentle. Everyone walks away feeling refreshed, meditative, almost. Amazed yeah, I managed right. to say that, considering <laughs> my lack of skill. Okay, so can you tell us all about 60 seconds on your background, please. Yeah, so I got started in sales 2008. My very first sales job was going door to door selling house painting services. We call it college here in the US. You guys call it university. Same same kind of difference when I was 19. Right. So I've always been kind of the, the cold outreach. How do we scale this activity of proactively finding customers? So I spent a lot of time with that company as a sales manager became a marketing director for them about four or five years into that. And the way I got into inside sales is this company would generate a couple hundred thousand leads on a yearly basis and maybe 10,000 homeowners would paint their homes. So we created an inside you know, call center, inside sales team, where we'd have you know, 20 reps making these outbound calls to a cold list, to the existing list, to people that didn't buy, and they would set up appointments for the field. Yeah, and since 2013, I, I left that company to consult and help other companies implement this type of thing. And in the last four or five years, the specific, I've moved specifically into B2B inside sales, which is, which is what I help now with. We used to do the prospecting for people, and now we train in, and coach sales teams. Uh, I work with BDR teams that have three people all the way up to AE teams I've worked with with 120, 130 folks. But always the focus is, how do we do outbound in a more efficient, you know, productive way that's going to get the attention of the people that we really want to meet with? Okay, so my, my question really is this. You've done both sales and marketing, and now you're doing outbound inside sales. Yeah, I've got that right. <laughs> okay, so you've seen those three key frontline positions, and you've worn out shoe leather and knuckle skin knocking on doors. So you, you've been at pretty much every end or every, every point in the revenue operation. Why are most organizations so badly siloed and disconnected? Because from the customer's perspective, that must be a very jarring and disappointing experience. Well, you talked about this actually the last time that we spoke, and it's this lack of customer a customer centric focus in how we acquire customers. You know, for a lot of companies, customer service that starts after we close the deal, right? It's normally called customer complaints, isn't it? Yeah, customer complaints. And we had a lot of those back in the day. I think that people aren't thinking about if I wanted to create a long term relationship with this person that we want to paint their home, because we could do a lot of other stuff for them or this business that, you know, is a whatever, you know, enterprise deal or want to work with them multiple years. I don't think that people are thinking about the journey. It's not engineered that way. It's they're optimizing it for what is going to get the lead in the door the quickest, what's going to get customers to take calls that are quote unquote qualified, which we could talk about that for an hour. (laughs) And we're only going to talk to people that are qualified. And then we're going to hand them off to two or three people throughout the sales process. There isn't a customer centric approach to, hey, what does this process feel like to the person experiencing it? The process is always, well, what's the SDR going to do after they talk? How are they going to qualify the person? How's the AE going to be able to prep for the meeting? How's that handoff going to work? 
Uh, what's the AE's process of taking it through? There, there is rarely, when I, at least with the companies I work with, a customer-centric approach to what does it feel like participating in this process? That's, that's the big thing that's missing from top down. So the obvious question is, why is it missing? What's stopping people from realizing that if they were the customer, they would see this and think, you know, this is a piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? This is a piece of shit. <laughs> well, do you know this whole process of being bounced from one to the other and then having to start yeah. all over again and go through what the fuck they call those automated uh, dial systems and yeah. then you eventually have option 17 after having uh, been on hold with Muzak for uh, 42 minutes and then you wonder why people get frustrated yeah well i would use and uh, these analogies have been very overdone but if we used a simple dating analogy yeah. think about what your behavior is going to be like if you're going out on a saturday night and your goal is to is to go home with someone or take someone home so you can hook up with them versus you having a long-term thinking of, you know what, my goal this year is just to hopefully meet someone I could get married to. Your short-term behavior is driven by the long-term thinking, right? And these companies are, I mean, they have a lot of pressure. They have a lot of pressure to hit targets. And the people that are managing the frontline folks are those managers. And then they're being managed hopefully by their directors. And these are people that it's a risk for them to think long term because it hasn't been done before. It's not getting revenues quickly in the door. And a more customer centric approach that takes time to implement. That, that's like a huge culture change within a company that takes time to implement. And there's it's probably going to get harder before it gets easier. So I, I, it's really I don't have a special answer. It's, it's lack of long term thinking and that short term thinking drives the, the short term behavior. Generally will come down to you what your ultimate paymasters are demanding and uh, whether or not they encourage or punish risk-taking that doesn't work. No one will bollock you for um, taking a risk if it pays off. They might, might sort of say something, yeah. um, but they'll forgive it. Yeah, and let's think about the, because I work a lot with the frontline reps, you know, and when I'm working with a company, the frontline reps and the frontline managers Think about what the advice is for someone that does prospecting, whether that's an account executive or an SDR or BDR. The advice is that if they're not ready to buy right now, we don't want to meet with them. So it's let's only pick out the two or three percent of low hanging fruit people that actually are interested in taking a meeting right now. I mean, you know all about this, man. You talk about this a lot. What about that other 20, 30 percent of folks that they could be influenced? you know, that are not necessarily looking for something right now, but they are, they're open to a better way of doing things. When you don't take a relationship based approach to that, and it's just, hey, let's just set meetings with people that want to meet and my AE is going to reject something unless they're ready to buy right now. So that thinking, I mean, that's how could you possibly create long term relationships with customers, if not by accident? That's the way that the meat grinder yeah. You know, because that's the problem. If you think about it, the problem is how do we get the attention of the people that, that can buy from us? And there's kind of two ways that people are attacking that problem, right? On one end, one very extreme end, you have this mass blast murder by numbers. We're going to fix this problem with volume. We're going to use the auto dialers. We're going to do all that other stuff. And then on a, the other extreme end is, which is also not great, is I'm going to personalize every individual thing that I do to everyone I reach out to. And we got to find a balance between those two things and yeah. the balance is like really hyper segmentation and looking for people that have patterns in and no no great company no senior level executive is going to take a meeting with with someone that reaches out to them in a really shitty way they just aren't yeah. you know so people aren't are, are they aren't thinking about the concessions that they're making short term it's just very short term they're looking for very short term results what can i get this quarter you know, and that, and that drives the short-term behavior. So you've got a blank sheet of paper and a magic wand, mm -hmm. and you're building the revenue operation from scratch. Yeah. What's the thought process working backwards? Yeah, the thought process working backwards is, I, I mean, I think of things in really simple frameworks. You know, from an acquisition standpoint, when I think outbound, getting those first meetings, I think of identify what are the best fit companies for us and the people that we need to 
uh, reach out to, engage. How are we going to get their attention and start a conversation? Convert. How are we going to get the sales process started? Secure those first couple meetings. When I think about it through that framework, identify what we want to do is look at our company's history and look at what are the best deals for us? What makes the most sense for us to go after? And let's create that hit list of accounts. I know this sounds like really basic stuff, but I work with companies, Marcus, that's, that don't even do account-based selling right now. Mm -hmm. There's no account-based approach at all. And they sell mid-market enterprise. They sell big deals. And they just give their reps a list of leads. To call yeah, and, and they're always after the new logo instead of maximizing the yeah. revenue potential within those accounts and the wallet share and yeah. then the lifetime value and then yeah. the ecosystem. Yeah, my uh, pal Brian Sullivan taught me that uh, an enterprise account is a marketplace. It's not an account. There's the alumni, there's supply chain, there's joint ventures, there's strategic alliances, there's customer's customer, there's family tree, sister companies, parent companies, subsidiaries. All of those you could get referred to. But yep. most people will go off and they'll just beat their head against the wall doing the dial and slam if they even yeah, get they that. Outbound on, yeah, they do outbound on hard mode. You know, that's like playing the video game on the hardest level possible, right? Yeah. And yeah, you might beat it and stuff, and that's that's kind of fun, or you might have a lot of pride in it, but it's not a very smart approach. You know, it's it's one thing I come back to that we might talk about today. And Tim Ferriss always says, to solve this problem, is there a way that we could subtract mm -hmm. instead of that? Instead of doing all this crazy stuff and looking for all these other things, it's how can we just get back to the basics? So the identify piece is what are those accounts? And if it's really big enterprise stuff, it's we ha we're, we're in probably a lot of those accounts. And how do we create a network effect? That's still prospecting. You know what I mean? Getting referrals from people, that's, that's a prospecting activity. Yeah, but you don't get gold medals for that. You don't get pat on the back and told that you're a hero. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another completely underlooked strategy is, you know, LinkedIn Sales Navigator has all of the technology built in for what you would need to get your entire you know, team link. You could get everyone on the company signed up using LinkedIn Sales Navigator, and it'll tell you all the possible people just even within your company. And you could add a customer list or whatever to it for people that have a first degree connection that likely know the person that you want to talk to at those accounts. So that, that's what I would do first is get like really, really focused on that. The people that I tend to interact with through the sales process, because that's another thing. Again, it's basics, Marcus. None of the stuff I'm going to blow people away with. It's like really getting back to the basics of let's reverse engineer all our best deals in our current clients and who were the people that we interacted with and in what order you know, to close this deal. Those are people that we need to get introductions to and prospect to. So get really centered around who are we going after. And I want to take that a layer deeper too. What are the typical priorities of these people? What are the problems we help with in their language? So I, I would interview, depending on the size of the company, even as a chief revenue officer, I, I would do the customer interviews. I would talk to 10, 15, 20 customers. And I would see if we could record those calls. I'd build those relationships so that I have the relationships with the customers so that I could ask them to do a fireside chat with my team. I could bring them on board and allow my team to pick their brain for 30 minutes, you know, but I would have such detailed stuff. I'll give you a quick example. I'm about to start work with a company today, a robotics company. They sell an automated welding platform that's super badass. <laughs> but the way they do outbound is it's very focused on, hey, we can replace welders. That's the entire message. Mm -hmm. They don't talk at all about what a, an executive, the people, the chief operating officers, the VP of operations, the VPs of manufacturing, the CEOs of these companies they want to break into, they don't talk about a strategic thing that those people are trying to accomplish at their company right now of the amount of welders that are coming into the workforce is growing at a rate of 4% and the demand is growing at a rate of 7%. They need this. There's, there's, an, there's an end game here that doesn't look good for people that need welders, mm -hmm. but they aren't educating the market on that. That was a no, no part of their outbound process in their messaging. So I get like, really, who are we reaching out to and what are those bigger priorities? Let's think outside of your solution for a second. Because that's where people always go to. Oh, well, we can help. I was like, take the word we out of this. I want you to talk first-person perspective as a 
VP of operations, when I prioritize my week on a Monday, what are the two or three things that are top of mind for me that are going to dictate how I spend my time? You can just ask people these questions. It's, it's, yeah. it's pretty easy, actually, to get this information if you have the customer relationship. So I'll go ahead and pause there. That's, that's where I'm getting started because that's going to drive every part of the outbound process. I'd, I'd go one step further, and you're already you know, two-thirds of the way there. Uh, in terms of really mapping out the true customer journey, which again, if you have a disconnected revenue operation, people only see their bit of it. And so they don't really understand what gets the customer to the point where they start making space to solve a particular problem or to create systems, processes, whatever it happens to be. Then they go into passive looking. And it's at that point that you can start nurturing, but you cannot contact them directly without expecting pushback because they're just not ready to buy. And whilst people still maintain the numbers game philosophy, you're never going to break that pattern because it's only when they're actively looking that they're ready to welcome a call from a salesperson, whether it's an SDR, an AE, or whoever. So what do you say to people who um, think that sales is a numbers game? Well, I'd say, how has it worked out for you so far? Let's just look at the data. <laughs> well, we're doing okay. Yeah, you know, we're hitting our numbers. Yeah, you're doing okay and you're hitting your numbers. Let's look at, I call this the rep load. What is the load for a rep to even bring in a meeting? Take all of the activities on a monthly basis, emails, calls, LinkedIn, whatever, and then divide that by the number of meetings that they bring in, qualified yeah. meetings, whatever, sales accepted leads, SQL, whatever you, you call it. The activity is like atrocious. It's hundreds of activities to produce a meeting. That's a really heavy load on that rep's back. That's, we're talking burnout today. That's a recipe for burnout. That's how you manage burnout is you look at that. This is not a metric you would see on very many dashboards, but number of activities to generate the result that you're looking for. It's not sustainable. Look at the average tenure of the people that, that stay on board. Like the thing that you're doing is not sustainable. Again, there's a philosophy that people are expendable. Uh, salespeople are always out there. But the reality is that if you look at the hundreds of touches and hundreds of activities, what's more depressing is once you get those meetings, how often you blow it because 88% of first meetings on average do not result in a second. So now to get to a second meeting, you are talking thousands of activities. The average is in the region of 3,240 touches or activities along the way to get one meeting to second. In what universe? What's the law of conservation of energy? That's really moving towards entropy and inertia then yeah, the, the whole thing comes to a grinding halt. Um, it's just way too hard to produce the result. I, yeah, it's way too hard. Okay, but you've got, you've got old school managers who think that it's a numbers game and who instead of stepping back and saying, what could we do less of and do it better, they simply use brute force and throw more warm bodies at the cannon. How do you break that cycle? Is that I even possible? The, I don't think a manage, um, the managers can break that cycle. And the reason for that is, you know, I think of the, the managers as kind of like the boots on the ground, if you used you know, military analogy. It's like they're the people out there leading the troops. They're just taking orders. The managers don't dictate what the system is, what tools they use, what the goals are. They don't dictate any of that kind of stuff. Nor do they have any of the training that they would need in order to properly train and coach their reps either. It really has to start at the top. You know, I can talk on and on about managers and, and what we need to do for managers, but that's, that's the biggest problem, I think, right now. When I work with companies, typically the first engagement is to, is to help them with their reps. And what we start to reveal through that is every manager wants more help too. How do we coach them? How do we do really basic stuff like call coaching or helping our reps select the right accounts? And how do we actually coach them, not just tell them, Anthony Ian Arino, I don't know if you've spoken with him before. Yeah. Big fan of his work. One thing he talks about is, you know, we're, we're not trying to transfer knowledge here. We're trying to transfer competence. You know, 
that's something that needs to be taught to a manager. Most people are terrible. And I would include myself in there. I wasn't like a born teacher. I didn't know how to do this stuff. I had really good training as a manager. But how do you actually transfer skill and competence, not, not knowledge? Well, th this is one of my huge bugbears with the training industry because trainers don't focus on the thing that people buy training for which is I want my results to improve. Yep. I'm doing a round table with uh, five uh, buyers of training later this week, sales training. Oh, cool. Um, okay. And so I, it's going to be an ask the buyer session, what they actually want. Because I think that there's a disconnect as well, because I think a lot of buyers of training, particularly from uh, learning and development, focus on things like retention. I don't care how much you remember. What I care about is have you actually improved your performance? That's why I'm spending money on training. For every dollar I put in, I want $10 back, or whatever it happens to be. And it needs to be reinforced. But again, I don't think trainers spend anywhere near enough time fighting the case and saying, you know, by all means, get someone in to come and do a, a dog and pony show, but you're wasting your money. If the results don't improve, call me back. I think there's not enough standing up to the customer. But equally, I don't think the customers know how to get what they want from trainers. It concerns me because I think over the next 10 years or so, a huge number of entry-level sales jobs will disappear. And if managers don't know how to develop people, if there isn't that runway, that apprenticeship, then as a profession, I think we're in deep trouble. And I think the trouble's already started, but too few people are responding to it. The buyer needs to be re-educated. I'm 100% on board with you with that. And I compete with, in SaaS, at least when I'm selling into SaaS, I compete with a, a lot of the top training, either companies or individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, my selling point against them always is, oh, so they're, they're going to come in and do two, three-hour sessions with your team. Yes. What happens after that? What, what are the anticipated outcomes? How are the skills reinforced? Do they meet with the leadership team? None of that kind of stuff, man. Yeah, it's bizarre. None of it. It's kind of tough. I mean, I get kind of coming from their position. They're giving the buyer what they, what they want instead of what they need. Yeah, kind of like Nokia inventing the smartphone. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that story, actually. Nokia invented the smartphone. Their management was saying, we've got to do this. And senior management said, well, that's not what made us successful. We're going to continue okay. churning out the 3310 and the brick. It's interesting how tradition, habit, what you used to has such a hold. How do you make sure that when you bring these concepts into an organization, that they stick with them? Because inevitably, under pressure, our temptation is to fall back on what you know, we were taught first. Yes. Okay. I'm glad we brought this up because I feel like we're getting a little bit more into my zone of uh, expertise and that that's coaching and, and training and creating yeah. buy-in. Let's think about it from a really basic standpoint. Let's put ourselves in the consumer end of a coach, trainer, working with anyone that's trying to create behavior change for us. We have, there has to be a belief that it's going to work. And how do you create the belief? I have to try something small and get some sort of result, some sort of positive result with it. And then you got me hooked. Right. And if we use personal training or personal fitness as a as an analogy, it would be helping someone lose a couple pounds in the first week doing something that maybe they didn't think would be possible or whatever it might be, or making small little tweaks here. My mentors always always say uh, small hinges move big doors. I love I love that saying. <laughs> it's those little small things that, oh shit, I I I lost like a pound this week, two pounds or whatever. I haven't been able to do that. For me with outbound. It's I have to give them a little bit of what they want in the very first session. So I typically do the first engagement with me is a really, I call it an outbound accelerator, but it's really a foundations program. It's let's make sure we're doing all the basics. The very first day, I'll go through a checklist that I call the five rights. And I'll go through with all the reps and I'll say, hey, there's five areas right now. I'm going to go through. You can use it to troubleshoot what you're doing right now. And I'm going to give you one actionable thing. I want you to pick one thing to try. And you're going to report back in two days what the results are. So one of those things is, hey, are we going after the right accounts? And 
I really go look into that and say, hey, are there any accounts that you've been prospecting into for like literally just months and gotten no results? And when's the last time you refreshed that accounts list and added a new account to it? That's usually one big thing. Another big thing is, hey, when we reach out to people, statistically what we need to do in order to grab their attention, almost all the data will show you is they need to get 10 to 15 touches over the course of 30, 45 days between email, phone, social, whatever it might be in order to secure a meeting. So how can you get some extra email touches in there? Oh, hey, when, are there any prospects that haven't responded to an email in forever? Let's just reply and say, any thoughts, question mark. That right there, what always happens, Marcus, is people literally do it that day. Two days later, they say, oh, I got a response from someone that hasn't responded to me in forever. And he said, yeah, let's meet. And like that right there, that's how you create buy-in. I think that people look at transformation. They look at it in this huge, big, we need to change the entire strategy. You know, how do we break this up into bite-sized chunks yeah. and give people little things that they can do right away and get a result? I want something that can get a small result in 24 to 48 hours so that people are bought in. Because once I do that on day one, like their attention is mine for the next six weeks. They'll listen to anything that I have to say. And that's what I think most sales leaders don't think about is how do I create buy-in? If I had to approach this like a trainer or an outside consultant with my sales team, how would I do that? They treat it like, oh, I'm a VP of sales. I'm a CRO. I'm just going to tell everyone what they need to do. And then the managers need to like basically bully the reps around and make them comply with this process. That's how they approach rolling out a, you know, a new strategy or approach. I think the strategy of looking for little victories is yep. really important because that's how you give the positive reinforcement. And I think far too much of sales management in practice is beating people with a stick or a carrot. They don't get yep. to eat the carrot. They just get beaten with it. Incentives, uh, another huge area that I think is poorly understood. You know, competition, spish, all those kind of things seem to have, except in a few exceptional circumstances, a negative effect. The number of times I've spoken to sales leaders and said, you know, we're running an incentive, but it doesn't seem to be working. Or it's Mike is going to win it. So no, no one bothers to participate. And I think there's not enough attention is paid on the individual rep's needs. So often you'll see training happen because the manager wants to avoid telling Tim that he's dim. So they say, well, we'll put everyone on training. And mm -hmm. I've seen that happen time and time again as well. Yes. Do you have a, a really good analogy for this? Is, do you have a dog or ever owned a dog before? Yeah, yeah we have a very drooly uh, Labrador. Yeah, okay. We have a little toy poodle. His name's Pepe. He's 12 pounds. So in, maybe this is... I don't mean to treat your reps like dogs or animals, by the way, through this analogy. So <laughs> hopefully no one's listening to it like that. But what's really important when you train a dog is that if you're, if you're trying to get the dog to do a basic thing like sit or go potty outside or whatever, what's really important is that you don't force them to do something that they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. So when the dog is not sitting, you don't just grab its butt and push it down to sit. You actually make it sit by itself and then you mark the behavior yes, or a clicker, whatever you use, you give them a treat for willingly doing the right thing, even though they don't even know what the hell they're doing. Mm -hmm. And you think about that approach, uh, again, helping a dog when they're scared of something too. So our dogs, he's a little scared of heights. So he's a little weird around the edges of decks and stuff like that. So anytime we catch him, you know, being a little weird and scared of stuff, we try to treat him when he actually attempts to go over there instead of pushing him into something that he doesn't want to do. How does this relate with, with reps? Well, think of what we do. We force them to comply to a process that they don't like, don't feel comfortable with, aren't properly trained for, and we don't reward them for any of the effort-based things, the behavioral things that will drive the result. We only reward them for the end result. Right. I agree. So if we look at our processes and look at why we do things, very often that's steeped in tradition and we end up with a culture where someone new comes in and they're very quickly told and their wings clipped but that's not how we do things around here mm -hmm. 
And I think that speaks to another really interesting aspect uh, to sales, which is the uh, homogeneity of most sales teams. They talk about being um, an equal opportunities employer and welcoming diverse uh, groups of people. But they make it impossible for people who are different to stay. Yeah. Blind obedience is uh, a quality that, that's treated with more value than innovative thinking or entrepreneurship or risk taking. And I definitely see that as being a major problem, which is why it's so, so much of selling is formulaic and it's focused on tactic instead of really understanding other human beings, what drives them. Yep. I'm really quite looking forward to that call on Friday to understand yeah. why, the, why there is so much emphasis on technique. Yeah. Because it always feels like you're having something done to you when someone uses a technique to try and manipulate a particular reaction from you. Oh, it drives me crazy because I know what people are doing. Like we're in sales, right? We've yeah. been around the block. One of the things that people do so much to me is those no-oriented questions. The, hey, would it be a bad idea, Marcus? And people go, hey, would it be ridiculous if we did this? Hey, would it be ridiculous to get a response to this? It'd be ridiculous to, I'm like, dude, no one talks like that, man. Yes. Stop, please. But yeah. the, the problem, it's really basic, you know, coaching and teaching philosophy. It's called format. It's the number four and then MAT. I don't know if it's a worldwide thing or if it's mostly focused in the United States, but it's, it's really just a concept of why, what, how. When we're yeah. teaching something to people, do we explain the why behind um, how, the approach? You know, do we explain the why behind the quality first approach? Do we explain what, what to do? What are the bullet points? And then are we able to bridge that to a how? The focus a lot in sales right now is on how. Yeah. Say this exact opener when you cold call people. They don't, they don't go a, step, a couple steps above that and say, hey, when we cold call people, let's, let's think about what does the person on the receiving end of this need to experience in order to just go past the first 10 or 15 seconds? What familiarity are we bringing in to the equation? Are we introducing ourselves? What's our tone like? How do we come off? Are we demonstrating business acumen as soon as possible that we know something about them? Then what to do? Permission-based opener. People go straight to the how with this. And that's what I see as the two extremes. They, there's way too much why in theory and how we approach it and say, hey, here's what you should do and, and why you should do it. Good luck. And people don't bridge it to the how because they don't know how, I don't think. They don't actually know how to do that, or they focus so much on how and don't allow reps to be resourceful. They completely rob people of their resourcefulness by telling them exactly how they should do things. You got to have all three of those things. You got to yeah. have why, what, and how. You got that's got to be fabric. Every part of your training has to include the entire array of how people learn. One missing element of that again, which I think is really essential is getting customers involved in the training. I'm really excited by the, um, the idea of having customers come in and play the part yep. and give feedback. Being on the receiving end of that, that was terrible or that was great. But the, the piece that you touched on, which I think is really critical as well, is business acumen. And almost no training focuses on developing that. No coaching, you know, almost no coaching develop, um, develops that either, certainly at a management level. And that lack of insight means that you can never really put yourself into the context in which the customer lives and works. And yep. if you don't understand that, how can you possibly, you know, look at that 20 to 30% and influence them? You can't, unless you get lucky. Yeah. So, and lots of really uh, and that's really and that's what people do is they're playing just law of numbers, right? How many, if I can get into the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of data points of my outreach, I'm going to get lucky where I catch someone that happens to be thinking of this, but that doesn't really fit into the 20, 30%. And the other thing it does, um, Dan Sullivan said, the price of free marketing is all the people who will never do business with you. And I think people don't, because if they have short-term thinking, and short-term behavior. They don't think of a long-term price. And that's a very heavy price. Yes. You know what one of my clients was dealing with before we started working together is 
when you have dozens of reps trying to break into an account and people are prospecting to C-level folks, you know what they do is they, they blacklist your domain so that none of the emails come through into their company. This is a company that you will forever never be able to communicate with through email. And then if the people ask to be put on the do not call list, you can't email or call the people that you need to talk to at this company. It's, it's a, an opportunity that is forever burnt. That's happening right now. That's how, I don't know when, if and when we'll get to this in terms of future of sales, but that's, that's something I think is very scary that people aren't thinking about is the long-term consequences of really shitty messaging, a really shitty approach that doesn't prioritize the buyer, that doesn't demonstrate that you know about them, that isn't va- you know, creating some sort of value and putting content and education either through your webinars, whatever it is that you're doing, you're doing nothing to educate customers. And you're going to be forever banned from communicating with people at that company. It's, it's happening a lot right now. So if you're new to a role and you found that you're getting blacklisted or you've been blacklisted because of your predecessors, what advice would you give to a rep in that situation? What advice would I give to a rep that's... <laughs> they, they've just inherited a bunch of accounts where <laughs> the company's name is Mud. God, it's so hard for the rep. I thought you were going to ask me what I would do as a leader, but I would, I would personally reach out to these people through a personal email address right. and, and be totally humble and say, we totally messed this up. We'd love to get feedback from you on how we can do this better. We'll pay you for your time, you know, to get that feedback is what I would do as a sales leader. Right. As a rep, God, that's been handed accounts like that. My, my advice would be, obviously, you can't use email and, and phone. We got we to gotta figure out a LinkedIn game <laughs> first. But I would talk about why that happened. Let's talk about the people. There's a really basic, Skip Miller has a book I love, Selling Above and Below the Line. There's a really basic concept of why do executives choose to take meetings and how do they buy versus a manager director or someone that uses a product? And you know, there's just called? really basic things. Uh, selling Above and Below the Line. And by? Skip Miller. Yeah, really great book. I re- it's super short read, but the concept... For those listening, because you're, you're probably very familiar with it, Marcus, is that above the line, your VPs and your C-levels generically you know, are going to be more strategic. They're going to care more about strategy. They're going to care more about three months, six months, nine months, three years from now. And it's going to be very, how does this help us grow our revenue, increase our profit, or reduce our, our uh, expenses? And how does it help us reduce risk in some sort of way? And these are people not typically using the products, yet we try to pitch demos to these people. Right. The below the line folks, the directors, managers, users of products, whoever. And either one might be your way into a company, by the way. It depends on what kind of product you have. But they're going to be very tactical. They're thinking about what's going to help me today. What's going to make my life easier this week? What's going to make my team more productive? And all of the time, I see messaging to C levels that sounds like this Hey, we help product teams that uh, have to pitch their roadmaps to non-technical buyers to get buy-in, or we make that job easier. And I'm like, well, when you reach out to a C-level, they are the person that's being pitched, the roadmap dude, okay? They're not the one doing, they're not the ones that need help. The people that work under them are the ones that need help. And just that basic, I see this just rampant, especially when messaging is not provided for people. It's this generic, here's messaging that's gonna apply to everyone. It needs to be hyper-specialized by persona. And then you need to do that by the individual. But I'm working with a company right now. There's, I mean, there's eight different business lines that they sell into at hospitals. It's like, hey, we have to, and there's multiple personas within those business lines. We have to come up with messaging for every single one of those. Absolutely. And this is where I think the future of selling and marketing really requires much greater alignment. Because if marketing is able to create those talk tracks and those uh, message themes, then you can uh, hyper-specialize. I don't think you can personalize at scale. That, I think, is one of the biggest myths that the marketing industry has peddled. But it's a lie. You can be relevant at scale, but personalizing at scale is now an impossible. Unless you're micro-segmenting and unless you're creating those tailored messages for those tiny groups, then you're just going to be bouncing off them constantly. Yep. 
so what should young reps really be doing in terms of developing themselves so that they're ready for this very savvy environment where buyers have access to the sum total of human knowledge with a few strokes of a keyboard. Yeah. If I'm a seller, and this is my advice to everyone, is I'm getting really, really intimately familiar with the priorities of the people that I talk to and the problems that get in the way of those things. And those are very different things in my mind. The priority is what do I get up every day? And I, I don't I don't get up in the morning and say, what problems do I have to overcome today? And I, you don't really think like that. It's more of an aspirational, you know, kind of thing. Hey, we know that we need to hit this revenue target, right? And this is the thing that I'm working on related to that. The priorities, I need to understand what gets these people out of bed and how they prioritize their time. And then I need to understand the relevant problems that we help with that, that can get in the way of that. And I want to be intimately familiar with those things. If I'm a BDR, SDR, I'm doing really basic stuff like the AE better be recording all of the sales calls, the discovery, the demo, whatever. And I, I listen to all of the discovery calls and demos for the meetings that I set. I'm really intimately familiar with in Salesforce looking at what are the inbound deals coming in? What are the job titles? What are people putting in descriptions? What are the notes that salespeople are taking from those conversations? I want to be able to have those higher level conversations. And that's really... I, I want this mode of understanding why. I want to understand why. I want to be intimately familiar with who we sell to, why they buy, what they're working on, how it fits into the grand scheme of their business, not just the product that I sell. I really want to get familiar with those people. That's the thing that's going to help you do really well as an SDR, BDR, and get the promotion to AE. And that's the thing that's going to help you crush it as an AE, is being able to talk to people exactly like them and say, I talk to uh, dozens of people like you and, and here's what they tell me. And you rattle off a couple of things and people are like, okay, cool. Marcus, he knows what he's talking about, right? This, this guy, he's, he's got business acumen. He talks to people like me. He knows my world. That, that demonstration of business acumen is totally missing for most rookie reps. And a lot of it's experience too. It takes time to get those things, but it it does, and I think it's important that reps understand their responsibility in terms of their own learning. I'm firmly of the belief that we need to stop calling it training and call it learning and put the yeah. emphasis back on the individual to develop themselves, to ask questions, to seek out help, to study. I think part of the problem is that the majority of people end up in sales by accident. Very, yeah. very few people as kids said, you know, I want to be a salesperson. And because of that, they always, certainly for the first few years, they're probably thinking of it as a stopgap whilst they try and get a proper job. And then those habits are ingrained. And then they get promoted through tenure and maybe, you know, because they're a higher performing rep into management, but they don't know how to transfer the skills. So one area that I think we really need to focus on in terms of the future is management development. Your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. Just doing something would be a step in the right direction. Most companies have zero training for managers, but just really basics. Like think as a rep, what we expect of a rep, we expect you to know how to manage your time. And we expect you to know what the ideal week should look like. We expect you to do this type of learning and all this other stuff to have these conversations with customers. Well, how come with managers, how come they aren't taught? Well, ideally, what are the buckets of areas I should be spending my time in? And when it comes to my job, coaching, training, hiring, leading my team, what are the skills associated with all of those things? But yeah, doing anything would be a step in the right direction for most companies. There's literally zero stuff done. You know, you're laughing. You know, this is true, Marcus. Yeah. There's really nothing for managers. Well, it, it goes to the next level as well, which is that managers do not receive anywhere near enough coaching. So again, that speaks to the leadership level. There isn't that cadence there. There isn't that culture because we hire grownups. And we don't want to be uh, mollycoddling them or interfering until we do. Yeah. And then what you end up finding is that those interventions tend to be the death knell for that person's career or certainly their job. 
The other big thing with management too, I think the, the challenge is that because there isn't this, you know, transfer of competency is that when a manager doesn't do well or they do okay, it's a major pay cut if they did well as a rep. So we're putting these people in positions where it's much harder, they end up working more and they get paid less and they get less support. That's a broken system, man. Mm. It definitely is. I, I, so what are the glimmers of hope? Well, I think the glimmers of hope are, one, being able to recognize that. You know, Two, if you're a manager, I don't see, managers don't invest in themselves much at all. Invest in yourself. If you're not getting it from your company, invest in yourself. There's lots of really good training programs out there and coaching programs and all kinds of stuff for managers. There's a lot of great resources out there. Just because your company is not going to bring those resources in, invest in yourself. That's where it starts. Invest in yourself. People will do the thing. If you can become a top manager at your company doing some of these things that you spend investing in yourself and learning outside, people are always in sales going to want to do whatever works. And if you make that work, be the case study internally for your, for your company. So the obvious pushback at that point is, well, why should I? Okay, if, if you're happy being overworked and underpaid, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> I'm not in the business of selling people on why they should get outside help. I, I really don't, don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to sell people on why they need coaching and training. If you're not open to the idea of doing something differently and you want to improve, I, I don't want to talk to you, you know? I don't want to talk to you. So, so if you're that person that's giving pushback to looking outside of, of your own company for stuff, if you're happy doing what you're doing, then no, maybe don't do it then. I'm totally fine with, with walking away from that. Excellent. Okay. So to wrap up then, talk to me about the biggest challenges that you're seeing young reps face at the moment with the pandemic, with this rise in technology spaghetti that they're all getting forced into the lack of support what, what's all of this culminating in and where will the change come oh man there's a lot of challenges for reps i mean we've talked about a lot of them but i think in in general the the big challenge is the phone is a really good tool and it's it's very hard to get people to pick up the phone these days when you look at pickup rates and i have a lot of opinions on that because I, I cold call for my clients. So I, I try to have a consulting client or two at a time. And part of what I'll do for them is, is cold call. And the reason why I do that is I want to be really in tune with what they're doing. It helps me work out messaging and all this other stuff. But part of it, I think, is a lack of intensity and in using excuses. Because for some reason, when I call and I don't use a dialer or anything fancy or special, I have like a 30% connect rate You know, when I, when I call people, when I cold call people. In the sort of industry average for at least everything from what I hear is under 5%. Yeah. You know, to get people to pick up the phone. So there, there's some sort of disconnect there, but I think getting people to pick up the phone, that's a really big thing. Being a little bit more clever and having a reason and being able to use multi-channel using email, phone, LinkedIn, using all of these things together to deliver your message. I think the second thing too is what I see a really big, and I'm thinking of my clients right now, uh, a really big weakness is just basic copywriting skills. Their ability to put together an email that's three or four sentences is, is uh, it's astonishing. You know, most of the stuff that people are sending are freaking novels. And they <laughs> sound really good on the phone and they're able to communicate that message through phone. They're not able to translate that into what an email would sound like. You know, so I think that the communication through written and verbal communication, like those are tangible skills that you could work on. But um, I think the lack of copywriting skills is a big one. And the other thing too is, and again, this kind of goes back to a learning thing, but a lot of people are visual learners. How are you being more visual in the way that you do outbound and in the way that you sell? How are you incorporating, you know, last time we talked, you have a genius model that I saw, right? How are you teaching through models? Uh, one thing that I'll do when I coach and train is I have a little camera here. I'll share my desktop. And yeah, it's like a whiteboard on a piece of paper where I'm right. Your ability to do things like that and make a virtual setting more visual, just because someone can see you and you can share your screen, that's not what I'm talking about. How do you actually visually teach people and engage them when you're doing outbound, when you're selling? Those are the really big things that I think people need to, need to really think about. Is, and it's a total, it's a huge pattern interrupt. When you can do that. It's an enormous shift away from just the 300 dials a day or 
hide behind email. Yeah, th- this yeah. actually takes real intelligence and thought. And my pal, Ben Elijah, has a view that the uh, necessary IQ to be a salesperson is going to consistently go up. So it's around 120 at the moment to be a, a moderately successful enterprise salesperson. But as technology becomes more sophisticated, as you have to work more with strategic alliances, you have to work with competitors, that IQ requirement will go up. Um, your thoughts? Yep. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because all of the stuff on the, you know, the bottom end of what a rep is doing is easily automated or fixed with tools. You know, it's uh, your ability to pump out volume is no longer something that uh, is a necessary skill because tools will do that for you. Your ability to find and consume information, there are tools that will gather all of that information for you too. They'll show you buying intent. They'll gather triggers for you. They'll scrape a person's LinkedIn profile. All of that stuff is going to become, you know, table stakes, as they say. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree 100%. I think those are going to be the only people that make it in a sustainable way too. I mean, you look at an enterprise sales rep, how many years does it take to become competent, really a really competent enterprise sales rep versus someone that's selling something SMB, super transactional, Yeah, you know, and we're going to really move away from salespeople needing to be heavily involved in those transactional sales for sure. Well, Phil McGann says that a salesperson hits their stride in a job after three years. Yeah. And that, that's what he did his PhD thesis on. And with the turnover, with the uh, constantly shifting priorities, the latest uh, technology du jour, people get distracted. And I think mm-hmm. you need to do the basics well consistently over time yeah. and mean it. And that seems to have been forgotten. Excellent. JB, look, we've come to the top of the hour, so we need to wrap up. You've mentioned one book already, which was the... Selling Above uh, and Below the Line. Selling Above and Below the Line by Skip Miller. In terms of developing copywriting skills, what would you recommend? Oh, damn. Copywriting skills. Well, one really basic thing you need to do right away if you don't have it is install Grammarly on your, uh, on your Google okay. Chrome browser. <laughs> to level up your copywriting, there's a couple of things that I really... Uh, Donald Miller's story brand... I think is really good in terms of just understanding how to tell stories. The other thing that I would recommend God, from a copywriting standpoint is uh, I really like the blogging websites. I think it's copy blogger. They might've turned into a different company by now, but if you consume a lot of the content online, that's for people uh, to help people with blogging and writing articles. It's the same concepts. It's active versus passive voice, right? It's, it's how to be more succinct how to load a sentence with the important stuff at the beginning. It's those types of things. So I love copy blogger. I'd probably start there. I'd look at the best resources online and, and copy blogger, I believe is the name of best resources online and, and courses for, for people to help them with their writing. That stuff's totally going to translate into how you write uh, you know, from a sales context as well. Excellent. And for cold calling? Ah, uh, man, unfortunately, there's not a lot of great stuff on uh, cold calling. I do like Smart Calling by Art Subcheck. That's a really great book. That's the one that I always recommend. And then our podcast is pretty good, Blissful Prospecting. I'd listen to that. What I would stay away from is get overlooking for the best way to introduce yourself on a cold call. Yeah, the technique. Get, get, get to like the messaging components, the things that you need, like the chunks of information you need to go through and the questions that you need to ask. Yeah. That's the big thing. Uh, there isn't a lot of really great stuff out there on cold calling, in my opinion, on, a, on a really how to use the phone properly. Art's book is probably one of the best that I've seen. It's very comprehensive. Excellent. How can people get hold of you? Blissfulprospecting.com is the best way. So there's a ton of free stuff there. If you're just looking, we got a podcast. We run webinars on you know, usually a couple times a week. All of that's there on demand. We got guides on how to do video, how to send email, all of that kind of stuff. And then we also work with both individual reps and companies. So if you're looking up to level uh, level up your outbound and maybe you're an AE, let's say, and you're doing full cycle sales and you want to fill some of your own pipeline, check us out. And, and if you're a company, especially that wants your reps to prospect more in the way that we're talking about here today, reach out to me at blissfulprospecting.com. We might be able to help you out. Excellent. Jason Bay, thank you. Thanks for having me on, Marcus.
So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you've liked and enjoyed this, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And feel free to leave an honest review on either Apple or Google Podcasts. If you want to get hold of me, Marcus at laughs-last.com. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.